Uh, if you gave him the mat, Matt will okay. do it. Okay. All right. So I gave them to him before. He Good morning. We'll call this meeting to order. Deborah, please initiate the roll call. Certainly. Vice Mayor Carter. Present. Commissioner Daly. Here. Commissioner Vignola. Present. Commissioner Simmons. Here. City Manager Goodrum. Here. City Attorney Hearn. Here. Thank you. If we could take a moment of silence, please. could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Abe, would you start the pledge for us? Next, we, I'd like to call up the Coral Springs Festival of the Arts Committee. Did turn it on. Oh, good. We were blue. I got it. It works. So, for those of you who don't know, the Coral Springs Festival of the Arts has been going on for 15 years. It is strictly volunteers, there's an executive board, and then there's 26 of us. I'm included in this group as well. And it takes about a minimum of $65,000 to pull this off. So it's through generous sponsorships and contributions that we're able to do this. And what makes it so unique from other art festivals is the fact that we have performing arts and then we have the music groups, Latin, country, big band. This year we're gonna have urban art, which we've had before, which is almost like a graffiti type art. And then we're gonna have clothes made out of wallpaper. And then there's a children's section, so there's so much for everybody to do. And all because it started with the passion of this woman, Shirley Richards. She is our chair, she is our fearless leader, and she's the one that guides us every year. So I want to turn it over to Shirley to say a few words. Hi, everybody. I hope everyone comes out. Um, we do have an exciting uh, weekend planned. And one thing that uh, Joy didn't think of is that the Festival of the Arts does support other art nonprofit groups. Any art nonprofit group in the area gets a free booth at the festival to promote their group and to uh, try to increase their membership. We have Friends of Music, the Art Guild, the Craft Guild, Southern Handcraft, a new group called Hometown Reads, which is made of local authors from the surrounding area, Gold Coast Jazz, the Museum of Art. Um, I hope I didn't forget anybody, but I may have, and if I did, I apologize. Um, I just want to, real quick, we do have a, a committee of 26 people, some of which are here, and they're, most of them are working people. Um, I just want to introduce the ones that are here. This is 
Spiro Edgo, Edgo Os, Egypt, sorry. Um, he's, new, he's new this year and he works on sponsorships. Mike Del Pozo, who is also new this year and he is working on site and traffic. We have Abe, he's one of the original people. He's been around for 15 years. He's headed up traffic. Vince Rebecca, he's our music chair. He's also an old timer who's been around for many, many years. Um, Leslie Del Pozo, who is, um, does our public relations. She's new this year. Linda Tenor, she's stepping in. She's also new this year. She's um, helping out wherever she can. Diane Yusefi, who works on uh, children's um, volunteers and um, our two new ones. A few years ago, the festival invited the Garden Fest, who was al alone way off in the southwest corner of the city to come to the festival and be part of the festival. So that's Marcy Damari, who's been doing Garden Fest, I think, longer than I've been doing the festival. And Bonnie Metviner, she is our chamber liaison. And sneaking in over on the side there is Giselle Rahal, who is um, our landlord and our vice president. So I just wanted to give them some recognition and I hope that you, if you have an interest in the arts, you'll think about becoming a member. Um, the weekend of, we have 500 volunteer hours from 150 volunteers that come in for a couple of hours and then these people work along with the rest of the 26 uh, all year round. The event is next weekend. Not this weekend, next weekend. So a special recognition to the Festival of the Arts 2019 for organizing the 15th annual Festival of the Arts in the city of Coral Springs, which encourages <coughs> awareness and appreciation for art and culture. Thank you for your outstanding efforts and the dedication to what has become a signature event in the city of Coral Springs. And it's signed by all of my fellow commissioners. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Is it on? It may have turned off. No? So make sure to put on your calendars next Saturday from 10 to 5. The music is amazing out on the stage. Stages. So next I'd like to invite up Pat Mirabella from Human Resources who is going to recognize some very, very special people who are being honored as Bright Spot winners for the city. Oh, you got it. Good morning. Every quarter we recognize 10 employees who get a Bright Spot nomination. And these are people who go above and beyond. We had 154 people who were actually nominated. We do a random selection and these are those 10 people. So we'd like to bring them up, recognize them one at a time. Christopher Gamba. I hope I don't kill any of these names. Mich Michelle Giannino. Did I say that right? 
Must be that Italian on my husband's side. Bob Hunter, I saw you here. Yay. Jiggins. Congratulations, Matt. Rosemary Rodriguez. Congratulations, Rosemary. Chelsea Stahl. We have so many wonderful employees, it's just great to be able to recognize them. Dana Thyman. Oh, she couldn't be here. And I know Michelle couldn't be here. Michelle Vargas Guerrero. She couldn't be here this morning. And we have Rena Zapata. Did I say that right? Thank you very much. I guess you want a photo op, right? Okay. Okay, next we will move on to public comment. Do we have any assigned speakers? Vice Mayor, yes, we have two. Jerry Decker, Christy DeNoble. Jerry, if you could state your name and your address for the record. Good morning. My name is Gerald Ann Decker. I live at 5893 Northwest 121st Terrace, Coral Springs, Florida. I've been a homeowner and resident of Coral Springs since 1980, and yes, I am a senior citizen and I'm almost proud to be a resident of this city. First, I would like to congratulate this city for the many improvements and awards we have received since I moved here. As you know, Coral Springs is the 14th top city in all of Florida. We rank number 17 out of 101 with the lowest average snowfall in the year in Coral Springs. <laughs> Coral Springs is the only place in the world without a McDonald's with no golden arches. Getting down to business. We have approximately 12,000 senior citizens ages 55 to 85 and 13,000 children ages 5 to 17. Our seniors have been raising their families here, volunteering, working, shopping, and paying taxes to this city for 40 plus years. Our young families between 3 to 16 years. Our city shows their appreciation for our 40 plus years of residency by giving us a building that seats 100 people. Only 55 people can use it at any one time. However, our younger constituents have access and availability to buildings and parks in our city, and in the summer, we're all kicked out and the children take over. We get four pieces of exercise equipment placed in the outdoor sun roasting with an overhang, no showers, while some employees, not all, get air-conditioned equipment with showers. Our seniors have a waiting list and are told we don't have additional money or facilities and can't offer you any more. So go to Tamarack, Coconut Creek, Margate, Sunrise, or use your silver sneakers. I don't have silver sneakers. This is how our city shows respect and appreciation to the seniors who have helped build the city. Shame on you. We deserve better. We're not going away like the snow or the golden arches. 
In fact, there's more of us coming, and I'm sure those 17-year-olds when I moved here are now your seniors. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Jerry. Next speaker. Please state your name and address. Yes, my name is Christiane DeNoble, and I live at uh, 10947 Northwest 12th Drive, Coral Springs. Okay. Um, I'm here as a senior citizen. I have written a letter last week to uh, Rick Engel, who is director of Park and Recreation, and I cc'd you, the vice mayor, I cc'd all the commissioners. I have received an answer only from Rick Engel, none from any of the commissioners. The problem is, as a senior citizen, I have worked and resided in this uh, city for decades. My, uh, I have volunteered in the schools. I have volunteered uh, into building, par helping to build parks. My husband has coach soccer, basketball. There's even a soccer rule named after him, the Joel De Noble soccer rule. So we have been very active in this community. I appreciated all the things that were done for my children while we were here. They are both successful adults. And I know that one of the reason is because they were here in the city. Now, when I see how I am being treated by the city, after all these years, is um, demeaning and uh, makes me feel very sad that this is all that has to be offered to us. We are not going away. The boomer generation is now aging and we're not going away. We're gonna be here for many years and we wanna be involved in the city. We wanna be involved in activities and we wanna be part of all this. We are feeling like we do not matter, we do not count. We are being told there's no money in the budget or we're not even being asked. Rules have come by all of a sudden. We were never consulted on how we could help. I offered to help. I told Rick Engel, if you need help, if you want, I got signatures from multiple people. I will help find ways to do this and I was told to get silver sneakers. Well, I don't have silver sneakers. A silver sneakers, for those who know about how senior citizen, you know, uh, how their lives are, would know that it's not available to everyone. And we want a program that is just for us adults, and this is what's going on right now at Sartatory Hall because they are able to divide it in increment of 30 minutes and give us a break in between. This is what we need as a as senior citizen. And I think that I have been told to go private by Rick Engel, I have the letter here, that he would be happy to help me find other places where I could work out in Coral Springs. And uh, you know, I don't need his help for that. I think I could find that by myself. That's not what I want. I want a place for us, the senior citizens. And we vote. Thank you, Mr. Noble. I was just gonna ask if there's any other speakers. <laughs> it's okay. Come on up and state your name and address for the record. My name's Brett Healy and I live at 10839 Northwest 45th Street in Coral Springs. I've already given my credentials for my daughter and I on December 19th when I spoke here to no avail. First of all, I wanna say congratulations to the 10 people who received the awards. We're gonna need you to step up one more time, please, for me and my daughter. Um, the last time I was here on December 19th, it was for a noise ordinance from the gym in our backyard that are screaming out, pounding weights um, and loud music. And I've got some lyrics and I'm glad there's no children here for the lyrics that my child had to listen to. I'm not sure that's a good idea because this is Mr. Healy. I still need to be heard. I understand that, but this is I can public. quote it for you if you'd like. No, I would prefer you don't. Well, I've got, a, I've got 150 to 200 videos of city ordinance being violated, and we have the best police department in the universe in Coral Springs, 
and from what I'm told is that the city is not allowing them to be the best. And the city says it's the police that are not allowing it. Um, they're violating city ordinance. They're screaming out, my daughter's been through two shootings. Should I read you some of the text messages that I get from my daughter? Because um, I think that's relevant to this as well. I'm, I'm annoyed and I'm tired. And um, you know, I teach my daughter that there's talkers and there's doers. Her and I are doers that talk a lot. And I'm here to be heard. I'm a little shaky and I'm a little nervous as well because I've been doing this for over a year since the school shooting. So this is a text message that I got from my daughter. Dad, you know those hammer things that judges use? A gavel? Yeah, so the class next door to mine was using that and banging it loud because they were having a debate. I caught, thought the class next door was getting shot up and I've never been so scared where I cried so quickly. I really thought it was going to happen again because it was banging so loud and consistent like the day of the shooting and it sounded identical to me. Hey dad, are you awake? At 2.47 a.m. There were three or four people who were just arrested for shooting a gun in the backyard while being drunk. Hey, Dad, are you awake? Please call me. I'm okay, but something happened in our neighborhood, and I just wanted to talk to you about it because I really got scared and had to pray the same prayer I prayed during the shooting. Five o'clock in the morning, this pounding weights that she had a dream, that she had a dream of the gym with the pounding weights that she wakes up to thinking there's a shooting in her backyard. And it's a BSO officer that owns it. So what are we teaching our kids? It's okay. The same BSO that played the music that said, call the police. That's what I thought. You all heard it. Do Thank something. You. Thank you, Mr. Haley. Do we have any other, uh, anyone else that would like to speak? Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. <coughs> Item three for our public hearings and special meeting announcements. Item three has been moved to um, policy formation. Item four, resolution 2019-008, Cross Springs Economic Revitalization Zone two. Attorney Hearn. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. This is a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs, Florida, making findings, designating as a brownfield area within the City of Coral Springs for the purpose of environmental re rehabilitation and economic development. Two contiguous parcels totaling approximately 16.13 acres located at Northwest 39th Street, Coral Springs, Broward County, Florida, 33065. Parcel identification numbers 484-118-000200 and 484-118-000150 at the Coral Springs Economic Revitalization Zone to pursuant to section 376.80 to see Florida statutes for the purpose of rehabilitation, job creation, promoting economic development, authorizing the city of Coral Springs to notify the Florida Department of Environmental Protection of said designation, providing for an effective date. This, <clears throat> Madam Vice Mayor, uh, takes two public hearings, so we're asking you to approve and set second hearing. Um, first, we're gonna have Mr. Goldstein, uh, who's here and represents the uh, applicant, Sawgrass Development Partners, LLC to go ahead and provide you the information consistent with Section 376 Florida Statutes. And after that, uh, Madam Vice Mayor, if you'd open it to the public. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Sure. No, <coughs> there we go, thank you. Um, Madam Vice Mayor, Commissioners, Mr. City Attorney, thank you so much. My name is Michael Goldstein. I'm with the Goldstein Environmental Law Firm. Office is at 2100 Ponce de Leon Boulevard. <coughs> in Coral Gables. I'm here on behalf of the applicant Sawgrass Development Partners, LLC, which is here to take a huge problem off of the city's hands. We have acquired a title to the former Coral Springs landfill, which the city has been um, uh, managing uh, in terms of uh, monitoring and cleanup for many, many years. We're ready to take the baton, uh, assume that cost, formally close out the landfill, close out the monitoring obligations, implement a cleanup, uh, conduct redevelopment, put in approximately 18 to $20 million in capital in uh, uh, redevelopment of the property for 
uh, small bay uh, warehouses. Uh, we're estimating that the job creation uh, count will, um, on the low end, be approximately 150 um, positions, and on the high end, three to four times that. Uh, we will add significantly to the tax rolls. We will remove the environmental blight and uncertainty. Uh, in order to do all of this, it's imperative that we are able to um, obtain approval from this body of a brownfield area designation, which is something that uh, this, this body has approved in the past quite successfully, actually for another client of ours on, um, on, on West Sample. And um, the process requires that we demonstrate compliance with the statutory criteria. There are five criteria that I'm happy to go through if this body wishes. The, um, the demonstration is in the materials. Staff has reviewed our demonstration of compliance and has found, in fact, that we meet the five criteria under the statute. If that demonstration has been made, then the, the process becomes somewhat mechanical. The statute requires designation. Uh, upon the satisfaction of the criteria. Um, and uh, again, our position is that we've, we've met those criteria, but we want the commission to approve the request because the commission believes that it's a good project. The, um, the designation will provide for limited but important economic incentives from the state of Florida. There's no cost whatsoever to the city of Coral Springs, either directly or indirectly. The uh, limited tax incentives, again, come from either the Florida Department of Environmental Protection or the Florida Department of Revenue. And um, this limited financial package will enable us to uh, secure the um, financing that we need in order to have the uh, project move forward. And again, we're looking at an 18 to $20 million capital investment <coughs> on a landfill that has been um, vacant and a source of blight and uncertainty for uh, 30 years uh, and counting. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that this body might have. I don't have any questions. I have a statement I'd like to make. Um, if, if, if you'd like, public. open to the public. The public. Okay. Yeah. Right now, we'll open this to public hearing. Would anyone like to speak on this item? It's in the corporate park. It backs up to the Sawgrass Expressway. It's a very long, narrow strip. I know what you're thinking. It wouldn't work. <laughs> okay. Done. Seeing no public comment other than Jerry, um, we'll close the public hearing. The second public hearing is set for March 20th, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. Looking for a motion to approve. Is there a motion to approve? Got a second hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, right. Passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jerry, I know where you were thinking, and I was also approached about the charter school, and <coughs> it doesn't work. Nope. No. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Item number five, special exception, Edison Power Temporary Storage of Vehicles, City Attorney. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, I'm going to read item five and item six together, their companion. Um, and uh, the request here is simply to open the public hearing, continue to the date certain of March 20th. The special exception is a petition of Big Investments for a special exception from sections 250638, 250814, and 250646 of the Land Development Code to allow temporary storage of supplies, equipment, machinery, and vehicles um, for Edison Power Contractors, Inc. and to not construct the required eight-foot high masonry wall in the Industrial Research and Development Zoning District located at the southwest corner of Northwest 120th Avenue and Northwest 39th Street, legally described as portions of Parcel O, Greater Coral Springs Research and Development Electric, Electrical Park. Uh, the companion is a conditional use on that same property. Again. That's a petition of Biggie Investments for conditional use approval in accordance with Section 250638 of the Land Development Code to allow temporary storage of supplies of equipment, machinery, and vehicles for Edison Power Constructors, Inc., the Industrial Research and Development Zoning District located southwest corner of Northwest 120th Avenue, North, Northwest 39th Street, legally describes as portions of Parcel O, Greater Coral Springs Research and Development Electrical Park. Um, so we'd like to open the public hearing. 
Um, there may be an affected party that, that has signed up as that affected party here. Does not appear to be. Um, uh, they know about the, uh, the hearing and they'll know about the, uh, the continuance to March 20th. So simply, uh, if we continue the public, uh, a motion now to continue the public hearing and uh, to hold this item in the public hearing on March 20th, 2019. Second? Who is seconding? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Item six, conditional use approval, Edison Power temporary storage. It's the same item, temporary storage of vehicles. Yeah, that one's been, right. yep. so that one, I read both of those and now we're just looking for, um, no, we can move them together to continue. That motion was for both yeah, those both. items to move. It was for both. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody want to pull anything from the consent agenda? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Policy formation and direction. Item three, ordinance 2019-103, second reading. Budget amendment, Catherine. Yep, yeah, and I will, uh, Catherine has a uh, presentation and I will read the ordinance first. In ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs, Florida, pursuant to section 166.041 Florida statutes to amend ordinance 2018-117, Finalizing and adopting the annual operating budget and capital improvement program for fiscal year 2018-19 by amending Exhibit A, the annual operating budget, and Exhibit B, the capital improvement program, providing for conflict, providing for severability, providing for an effective date. This is second reading. We've already had the public hearing on this. It's just a request to approve and adopt. Good morning. Staff has met uh, with the auditors and we have been able to meet our 17% stabilization fund. Staff is asking, uh, requesting the commission that we appropriate the remaining funds for, um, in excess for capital projects this year. Thank you. Second. All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Item 9, Comprehensive Annual Finance Report, Kim Moskowitz. Welcome, Kim. Good morning. After a lot of hard work, I'd like to thank the accounting staff from the finance department and all the city staff for their assistance in the comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year 2018. We have our auditors from RSM, Brett Friedman and Neil Harris, to do a short presentation and answer any questions. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Good morning. Um, for the record, Neil Harris with RSM. Also with me is Brett Friedman, who is the engagement partner. Um, you should have two booklets in front of you. The smaller one is our required communication. The larger one is the financial statements. Um, just want to start off by thanking the finance department for their cooperation through the audit process. Um, the audit process starts in November and goes all the way through February. So in addition to the normal um, activities, the staff also engages and helps us get through the process. So we want to thank them for that. And as we mentioned in prior years, um, the the city is one of the first to issue the financial statements each year, which is a great accomplishment. Um, we do audits from Miami all the way up to Tampa and Jacksonville, and the city of Coral Springs is one of the first to get the statements issued. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the required communications. Uh, for the current year, we did the audit in accordance with government auditing standards and issued an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level of assurance we can provide as auditors. It's a clean opinion, um, as they would say. There was a adoption of GASB 75 in the current year. Um, the significance of that is that it required that the city record approximately $27 million of other post-employment benefits that were previously only disclosed in the financial statements. Um, the standards required that the statements be restated to bring that liability onto the books. Just to point out that that is required by the accounting standards and not a, it's not an error. Every municipality went through the same process to record the, the item. Um, there were no significant unusual transactions during the course of the audit. There were no audit adjustments um, as, uh, in, during the course of the audit. There were no uncorrected misstatements that we're aware of um, to bring to your attention. No disagreements with management through the audit. Um, no other significant issues um, discussed with management. No difficulties, difficulties in performing the audit. We had access to all records um, as requested. We also issued two additional reports, which Brett will go over with you in regards to the controls of the city. Um, also included on page three are significant estimates um, related to putting the financial statements together. These include the estimate for the city's self-insurance liabilities, um, estimates for their pension plans, as well as their other post-employment benefits. 
we reviewed these estimates and determined that as presented, they're reasonably stated um, in the financial statements. Also included in the booklet is the management representation letter. Um, the importance of this is to see the representations that management has made to us through the course of the audit, um, so it's something to look at. And finally, just to go through the highlights of the financial statements, page one includes our audit opinion, which is the only um, part of the document that really belongs to the auditors. The rest of the, this document is prepared by the finance department. As I mentioned, it's a clean opinion. Um, looking at page 26, um, focusing on the general fund, which is the general operating fund of the city, for the year ended, the fund balance increased by $254,000 and the city ended in the, with a general fund balance of $27.4 million. And I'll turn it over to Brett to um, provide an overview of the compliance reports that we've also issued. All right, thank you, Anil. Good morning, everybody. Uh, on page 174, there's a brief summary. Basically, in addition to the financial audit, the city is required, based on funding received, to have a federal single audit and a state single audit. So 174 kind of summarizes the results. First, starting out, as Anil mentioned, there was an unmodified opinion on your financials, which is the best you can get. The other key thing to point out is, you know, we look at internal controls over financial reporting. There were no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies, no noncompliance. With regard to federal awards, also no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies, no noncompliance. In the current year, the major program was the highway planning and construction cluster. As far as the federal, now you go over to the state, same thing there, no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies, no non-compliance. There's an unmodified opinion on compliance for both federal and state. And the program that was looked at for state was the State Housing Initiatives Partnership Program. So with that, we'll open up for any questions. Thank you. Compliments to the Finance Department. Great job. Thank you so much for your work. Motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Item number 10, agreement William and Stephen Ladd. Attorney Hearn, you want to read? Yep. Um, Susan Christmas. Ms. Christmas coming up. Okay. Yep. Good morning. Upon approval of this agreement that we have before you today, we will be able to begin the second of the five artworks that we're working through with the Bloomberg grant that we've uh, been awarded. And this one is with the Ladd brothers that is an, a five by seven mural wherein they will be working with students primarily over the third grade and above. They will be attending uh, classes, art classes with the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School as well. And we'll be having a community day on uh, April 13th. So anybody can come and help at that same time too. And that location is going to actually be at the education center at the Broward Health uh, Hospital here. So uh, what, what they do is they take a scroll, they call it a scroll, and are drawn to the scroll by the colors that are provided, and they write on them or they create a thought, and, and it starts to talk, they start to talk with people about it in the, in the room. There's like 25 or 30 kids at a time. And these uh, Lad brothers have done this over and over with different experiences on different levels, and they're very excited to be here in Coral Springs doing this with us. So. We're very happy to get them going, and they will begin on April 8th if this is approved, and we hope by May 24th to be able to put, put this mural up, and we would like to loan it to Parkland first uh, to, ha to have them display it at their PREC Center it's, is the plan right now. We'll be coming to you later on with a loan agreement to do that if that works out with them. It gets displayed for up to a couple years. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. <clears throat> Motion to approve. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this question is for um, City Manager Goodrum. Uh, again, so with the this public art, this money, the, the money for it is coming through the Bloomberg grant, correct? We received the million dollar grant, so this project is being funded by the Bloomberg grant. And is there any uh, costs that will be associated with the City of Coral Springs in, as far as the installation or production of this uh, piece? As far as direct cost, if, if you can speak to it, but sure. I mean, we we have these uh, in service in kind services that we're providing as part of the matching stuff, but there's no real money other than the money that was de designated last uh, budget year for the public art fund using it, along with actually that was up to ninety thousand dollars for the whole 
two-year period. And if there are any anticipated costs or unanticipated costs, are, um, is there a process to possibly uh, speak with uh, the philanthropy organization to maybe recoup some of those costs or anything like that? I, I believe so. They are very interested in helping us market this <coughs> so they make sure that it gets out to as many people, and they've, they've indicated they could do that, and we certainly will be asking them about that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, it, it, Madam Vice Mayor, just to note that the, the, the agreement is being passed today, but it's conditioned upon them qualifying as a corporation in state and providing the insurance. Um, the artists are a little different than uh, other organizations that I deal with, so. Motion. Motion authorized. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Item 10. Was that? No, that was the one we just did. Sorry. Item 11. Uh, Danielle. Here. Oh, are we good? We're good. Okay. Ten downtown wayfinding sign program. Request to review and approve, approve the downtown package. Daniel Lima Cohen. Morning, everybody. I have Todd Milf Mayfield here from Axia Creative. He's going to present and also answer any questions that you may have. Good morning, I'm Todd Mayfield, principal of Axia Creative. And uh, we have a short little uh, presentation for you. So this is a recap of our Wayfinder program for downtown. I'm trying to locate the uh, presentation. Okay, so we'll, we'll table that for the moment and move to item 12. Downtown lines, also Danielle. I'd like to have Joshua Rack from Bermillo Adjamil come and talk about that. Good morning, Vice Mayor, Commissioner. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and present some of the exciting things we've been working on with the city over the last uh, few months. My name is Joshua Rack. I'm a senior associate at Bermeo Ahamel and Partners. And so we're urban designers and planners, and we've been working closely with the CRA and city staff and stakeholders on a couple exciting projects. And the first one we're going to discuss today is the development of the downtown design guidelines. Over the course of the last few months, we've been working closely, like I mentioned, with uh, the city staff and the CRA, uh, stakeholders, merchants, to develop these, these design guidelines. We've undertaken a, a pretty exhaustive planning process that you can see in the flow chart here on the screens. Um, just to, to summarize in, in general, we've done an, an, an existing conditions analysis where we've kind of studied the, the downtown area, the downtown mixed use area, uh, we go back to the merchants, um, work in progress meetings, kind of present our findings, and then start a, a, a general back and forth where we develop a little bit, take it to the public and stakeholders, we discuss our findings, we take their input back to the office, develop some more of the concepts, uh, and so on and so forth. So that brings us to um, today where we're presenting to you all the, the commission update presentation. So we'll get a little bit more in detail of what we worked on. What you see before you is the, the cover of the design guidelines booklet. And what these design guidelines booklet uh, entails is there are additional guidelines outside of the adopted downtown mixed use zoning ordinance that was adopted in I believe January of 2018. It provides a more graphic representation of the built code. So what, the, what was adopted in the zoning code are the, the policies and standards, and we've been working closely with the CRA and staff to kind of uh, graphic, graphically represent these concepts and standards and complement them with additional concepts that we would like to, to present to, to developers as they come in with their projects. Um, the, the big thing about this document is that it's going to give the 
the opportunity for the city to steer development in a predictive manner. So when you have this document and, and, and developers come in with a site plan, they think or they believe that they're following the intent of the standards in the zoning code. Um, oftentimes there might be something that's up for interpretation or discussion. And this document puts it on paper or writing what the official stance is of the public and of the city and staff. So there's, it takes out some of the guesswork and you can, you can kind of interpret or you, you can kind of see how development's gonna come in and what it's gonna look like and make sure that it's in line with the shared vision for the downtown. Uh, additionally, it's gonna establish a palette of architecture so we can, we can reinforce the brand of downtown Coral Springs. We're in this beautiful building we have uh, hosting us today. So we're going to establish a palette of architecture and, and architectural details, urban design details that are going to unify the downtown area, create an, identif an identifiable place within the city of Coral Springs. I'll take a, a, a little bit through the document of, of itself. So the zoning, zoning framework section of the document is basically a graphic translation of what these, the zoning code uh, currently says. We, we created some three-dimensional three graphics that you see on the pages and then kind of dimensional tables that accompany each of the graphics. So this is meant to just be a little bit easier to interpret and understand um, than, the, than the zoning code is, but it's all of the same concepts and standards within the zoning code. DRA conceptual design plan is the master plan that establishes the vision for the downtown area. So we took that plan and the intent of that plan that was vetted through, through the public process and start creating these design documents or design uh, diagrams that, that translate that diagram. So the street network diagram is going to basically say this is where the new streets need to happen, this is where the exi existing streets are. Uh, it's going to outline the new street network within the downtowns. All of that's already been kind of um, established in the, in the master plan. Open space network diagram, we were talking about open spaces and where those should be, where developers are expected to build those open spaces, uh, how, how we want them to be treated, kind of termin view terminus, view corridors. So establish this network of open space within the downtown area and the street frontages diagram, which will be important when it comes to how we want to service buildings, where garbage pickup goes, where utilities are placed in these new development projects. So all of these diagrams will kind of establish that vision that's in the CRA conceptual design plan. <laughs> From there, we, we get into a little bit more of the technical concepts in the, in the document. These are general development parameters we're taking a look at the access to development parcels, how someone would come into the development, how you, would, how you would drive, where we want that to happen, where we want to park your car, where the services go, like I said, with regards to street frontages and building composition and massing. These are all kind of concepts that come together uh, to create a mem memorable downtown place. So we want to have uh, Coral Springs be the identifiable uh, brand in, in this area. We want a nice downtown. We want people to come and enjoy and bring their business to the commercial uses. We want people to want to live here. So these are all concepts that kind of reinforce those ideas that were in the original conceptual master. Furthermore, we, we take a look at building frontage parameters. So the, the existing code might require a specific uh, type of building frontage that uh, a building or development will have. So what this section does is shows what those look like and then establish additional parameters for how the building is going to meet the public realm in the downtown area. So how do we interact with the buildings on a, a pedestrian level? The architectural styles palette is the is the style of architecture that the city wants to move forward with. We have a, a distinct style that, that's been set with this building. So how do we create an architecture that's um, compatible with this building that, that creates this kind of cohesive downtown for the city? We started with kind of a, an iconic South Florida Art Deco um, and then establishes all the different general guidelines, what, what materials are these buildings to be made of, the roofs, the doors, and windows. 
And that, that's kind of like the base style that, that, we've, that we've included in the design guidelines. And then it starts to evolve and become a little bit more contemporary. So contemporary masonry takes a lot of those uh, Art Deco elements, though it's just a little bit more concrete masonry with punched window openings to respond to the, the climate that we have here in South Florida and the sun. Then South Florida contemporary starts to include additional kind of technological advances. We have a lot more glass in the South Florida contemporary. This is the style that you see in a lot of new, newer developments in South Florida. So these are the three main architectural styles that we've established in the design guidelines for developers to, to provide for the city. We're very careful to look at street scene design parameters, uh, cognizant of new complete street design concepts that that we are now uh, moving forward with in, in a lot of municipalities in South Florida. We worked very closely with the city's uh, staff and established a palette of trees and palms, local native trees and palms landscaping that developers should be choosing from when they're landscaping their projects. Paving surface areas, we want to make sure that uh, we create these surface areas that are very safe to, to walk on for, for pedestrians, for vehicles, for handicap surfaces, we want to make sure that they drain, so we're establishing kind of a palette of pavement surface areas and street furnishings. This, the city has already adopted kind of a, a, a brand of street furnishings that they have, and you can see them when you, when you walk around this building, but we're talking about street lamps, benches, garbage cans, bicycle racks. All of these things are very important in an urban setting to establish that brand and create this sense of identity in the downtown. So we've just kind of formal, formalized them in, in adding them into this document. One important aspect of things that we looked at were new signage guidelines. So the current sign code is going to be um, taken a look at here in the, in the next few months or the next year, it's our understanding. So we wanted to introduce some signage concepts that might not be in, in, the, in the current sign code, but maybe would be t taken a look at in the, in the future one. And we provide kind of a do's and don'ts of types of signage and then graphic examples. This is the type of signage we want to see versus this is a, a, maybe a bad example of what that signage could look like if it's done incorrectly. So we want it to be very clear that developers coming in aren't giving you kind of these um, cluttered, undesigned, haphazard looking signage. We want high quality signage. Additionally, something that's not currently permitted in the zoning code is awning signage, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we want to introduce uh, new awning signage, but as long as it's done in a, a tasteful and designed way, we don't necessarily think that that's something that should be prohibited, so that's something that might be taken a look at. So that's the, that's the end of the urban design guidelines. I'm here for, for, to answer any questions with, with Danielle and city staff based on our experiences and love to talk about it and, and can provide any additional details you want before we move forward with the uh, master parking area, which is the next item. I think this is a very well thought out and um, I think it'll be a nice <clears throat> compliment to It's your one minute elevator speech on your company's qualifications and how you're educated in this process. So. Bermeo Ahamel and Partners is a full service architecture, engineering, urban planning, interior architecture. So we can, we're, we're capable of handling um, all types of different projects. We, we do architecture at the, port, at the port building. We're doing planning for a lot of the different municipalities, parks design. Um, my, my personal, I'm a, a, an architecture by, um, from the University of Miami, and then I studied my master's in, in urban design. So we've been, we've been working on a lot of urban design projects to kind of create these new fantastic places that people want to experience. So a lot of these elements that you see in the design guidelines are things that we're studying and we're trying to figure out ways to implement them in the cities. We do a lot of um, zoning code work, similar to the, the zoning code that was adopted here in the city, and then we go one step further and draft these design guidelines from our expertise on how to kind of implement them as you move forward with your downtown development. Very good. Anybody else? Chris too. Commissioner Vignola. I sound really petty. Um, I hate sable bombs with a passion. I think they're cheap. I think they look cheap. Um, when I look through a lot of your your presentations throughout, there's date palms, there's royal palms, um, you know, and, and all the pictures and stuff. 
not a lot of sable palms. I, I don't want to encourage sable palms. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's as petty as can be. And I think everything looks really, really good and great. Um, but we're encouraging a list of certain palms and, you know, you have some nice ones like Bismarck's and dates and Royals and things like that. As a city, we've always kind of encouraged as, as shade trees also. I don't know how the rest of that, and it's the state tree or palm, but yeah, I'd rather if we could remove that, that would be the one thing. But everything yeah, else I think looks, looks exactly palm. dead on par with the things that we were looking at doing back five years ago um, with some of our design stuff that we had agreed to move towards. So, but this is exciting stuff. Thank you. Commissioner Daly. I want to thank you and CRA and everybody that's kind of worked on this and made it reality. Um, obviously, as, as you may have heard, our downtown plan has been a plan for 20, 25 years um, and it never really taken shape. So this is exciting. I am a little troubled that you're a UM grad, but other than that, um, <laughs> okay. I, I, do like, uh, I do like what you guys have put together. So thank you for your work. Anybody else? So we'll move on to the discuss. I mean, uh, the master parking, or do we? Well, this is a request to approve the. Move to approve. Yeah. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. So the next, the next portion of our presentation revolves around the. The sample road master parking area. We've we've piggybacked this with the development of the design guidelines because we've hosted an exhaustive kind of public outreach, and Danielle's been fantastic with getting those rooms at the merchant meeting full, getting everyone participating um, to kind of establish a vision for the the sample road master parking area. To, be, to begin, we've established kind of a project rationale. So why do we need to take a look at the master parking area? The master parking area currently does not presently meet uh, full ADA compliance. So improvements to this area are going to need to happen wh whether we want to do them or not. So eventually we will have to, 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 to make sure this meets ADA compliance. Additionally, the development of the downtown, we have this beautiful master plan for downtown Coral Springs, and then this is an area that's just adjacent to the west. We feel that it need, it's an area that needs to be planned consistently, consistently with that of the downtown area. We don't want this area to fall behind at the expense of redevelopment in the downtown area. We want to make sure that this area is just as attractive for businesses and for people to, to use and bring their money and bring their business to this area just as they would in the downtown. So we want to make sure that this is kind of elevated to that level of high quality of design that's being established in downtown Coral Springs. Last, we want to improve the visual aesthetics and streetscape improvements within the uh, sample area, sample parking area. So we want to encourage pedestrian activity, connectivity, capture incidental car trips. Right now, it, it functions as a place where you know you have to go to a specific store, you get in your car, you drive there, you park right next to the store, walk in, walk out, and then drive away. So we want to start capturing more incidental trips where you're driving by on Sample Road and you might not know you needed to stop at that store, but you see it, it grabs your attention and pulls you in and would bring more business into these areas. So that was one of the important aspects to uh, redevelop this area. We came out on a number of occasions and did kind of an existing condition site tour analysis and these, this is what the area looks like currently. You can see that there's um, different landscape materials, uh, pavement materials. The awnings are very shallow on the building which isn't very positive for a, from a pedestrian standpoint because the purpose of the awnings is to protect you from the sun but if you can't fit under the awnings then no one's walking under the awnings. Uh, additionally, this kind of style of development um, doesn't, doesn't really match with the, the streetscape or quality that's going to be going on in the downtown. So we want to make sure that we have wide awnings, we have trees, we have beautiful trees and signage just to elevate the design of this area. So things we are looking at as we are walking around. We, we attended a, 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 new, a, a number of merchants' meetings and we obtained the following input for this area. They wanted to maintain as much parking in the existing lots, very important, in the front of the lots. Um, on a limited basis, they felt that people would park behind the, behind the stores in the, the other areas of the parking area. However, they made it clear it needed to be designed to be enjoyable. So we wanted to see additional lighting, nicer landscaping, gateways, 
um, things that are kind of drawing people into those areas to say, hey, there's not a spot right in front of the store, but I know that it's a nice walk to walk from the back of the store, so we want to make sure that we embellish these in the, in the master parking area. Again, we want to establish a sense of identity in the shopping center. We want people to know that we're going to the sample shopping center, have a, an established brand, and one of, one of those factors that, that improves the brand is kind of the, the visual identity of the area. We evaluate signage standards and explore awning signage, as we discussed in the, in the design guidelines. And we want to create uh, additional tree canopy that does not negatively affect the, the view of the, the storefronts. Their number one priority is maintaining visibility from Sample Road. So we need to be very creative as designers to find that balance to landscape the area, but also maintain that visibility for the, the commercial owners. Just to quickly summarize, there was a general interest in improving this area. Just make it clear for the record that it was not at their expense, which is important. Surprise. We developed, I think, over the course of, of the three or four months uh, in the fall and then leading up to, to December, we developed probably five or six different alternatives, and then they were pared down to the three alternatives that you see here in A, B, and C and presented them to staff, did a sta couple staff workshops, uh, another merchant's meeting, and then created this evaluation matrix based on the, the factors that we discussed with the merchants. These graded out, um, and option A ended up grading out the most favorable, and that was the option that the staff endorsed, the CRA kind of put their efforts behind, and then this is the, the option that I'm going to present to the commission today. So the overall master plan looks like this, and then the orange dots are just going to be things that I'm going to call to your attention, uh, design elements that, that I'll provide some photographic um, evidence of what those things look like. So what does this redesign look like? The redesign includes new pavement and striping. The, the city requires specific painting details on the pavement, so we're gonna re, we want to propose repaving and, and striping bringing the parking spaces to ADA accessibility, access ramps and surfaces, so make sure we have those ramps that are correct for, for ADA with the textured um, markings and then the bright paint. And then code compliant landscape islands. Presently there's not a lot of landscape islands in the master parking area, so the current code requires that there's one landscape island of a specific dimension every 10 parking spaces. So we need to make sure that we bring that up to, to code compliance and, and going to provide more landscaping and then improve that kind of street tree or uh, landscape canopy within the parking area. Want to incorporate additional textured crosswalks. Those serve to beautify the area, but also announce to drivers that there's pedestrians walking around this area and in improve safety of the master parking area. Uh, you notice in one of the photographs from our site tour that, that some areas have pavers on the sidewalk and then some areas just general general sidewalk. So we want to, we would like to see uh, the installation of pavers across the whole front of the facade. So it kind of unifies the elevation of the architecture. One of the, the, the main setbacks or the, the main negatives is, is a limited kind of sidewalk area. But we, we've formulated a solution whereas we don't need to take additional area from the parking so we don't lose as many parking spaces if we just install um, tree grates. So there's tree grates in the, in the trees out in the plaza. Currently in the parking area, it's landscape um, brush and, and low um, bushes. But if we put decorative tree grates, you can now put a chair or a table on top of the tree grates. It effectively extends the width of the sidewalk about five feet where the tree grate is. Additionally, we talked about the improved pedestrian connections to the rear parking lots. And the image on the right is the... Uh, kind of standard for what that could look like. So we just want to create a sense of place within these areas that are currently treated as leftovers. So if we create this sense of place, people will, will, will be intrigued of what's back there. Um, they'll want to walk back there, but they'll also find that those parking spaces in the back of the, the commercial area are, are ease of use, and then they want to use them if they don't have a spot right in front of the store, if it's an interesting walk from the back. Talked about code compliance for street tree spacing. The current, the current code requires trees be spaced on a specific interval, so we want to make sure that we bring everything up to code compliance. 
storefront awning signage that we introduced in, in the urban design guidelines. One thing that they were very, uh, the merchants were very interested in hearing about is how we would propose allowing them to do signage on their awnings. So we're, we're saying it's not allowed now, but if you wanted to, you could do it in this sense. And we would provide in the design guidelines specific sizes, logos that you could have, um, where they could be placed. So it's controlled, but it's giving them something a little bit more um, as, as this would redevelop. And then the idea of palms maintaining vi visibility. So the, the street trees directly fronting the, the commercial area, if we, if we do canopy trees, they're gonna block the they're gonna block the view of the storefronts. So it's, it, it's very important to, to prescribe street trees that grow up instead of in a 360 degree kind of head. So palm trees specific, the Chinese uh, fan palm is one that we've used in other areas in Pompano Beach. Um, that one will grow more upward like a V and grow above the level of the signage so you can still maintain that view from sample road of the signage. So this. The, the, the response at the meetings was generally pretty positive when we started talking about these types of elements that could be incorporated. Just to go through really quickly, this is an existing um, kind of drawing or interpretation of, of what the master parking area looks like today. The, the biggest benefit I feel for, for this option that we ended up moving forward with was that it's scalable and flexible to be implemented. So the city, if they wish to move forward with, a, with a, a scenario like this, they could do it in pieces, but as you go one, two, three steps, you're always moving forward to that ultimate vision that was established early on. So the, the existing is on the screen right now, and the first step, you could, you could bring all the landscaping up to code compliance, install those palm trees along the storefront, let, redo the, uh, the awnings, the storefronts and the commercial could redo their awnings with their new signage and then and install the tree grates. And that right there would transform the, the shopping center and the sample road parking area. Step two, you could install pavers. The reason this is on its own kind of um, phase is that the pavers would end up being the greatest expense when it comes to redeveloping a shopping center like this. They're, they're Pavers could be their own separate phase if you wanted to move forward with that. Then you could start working on the pavement and striping, the ADA accessibility, and then start to install the different landscape islands and street trees. Um, again, this is a consider considerable upgrade as to what you see right now in the commercial area. And then lastly was an interesting concept that was brought forward uh, over the course of our conceptual development. And I believe it was, um, you know, D Danielle brought forward this idea that if commercial owners wanted to, they were okay with losing a few more spaces uh, in, front of their, in front of their businesses, this option or this alternative allows you to create these plaza-like spaces to expand even more into the parking area. And then you can start putting tables and chairs and creating these little plazas for people to sit and enjoy the businesses. So again, we wanted to be cognizant that we're focusing on the future development of the area in line with the downtown area. And this is the type of development that could be happening in the future. So this was a, this was a fun one that, that, that we could kind of set that ultimate vision and, and have it look like this. So to summarize, the, the alternative that I just presented considers the input of stakeholders, merchants, the city, CRA staff, and the, and the officials. Uh, it was a balance of number of parking spaces that were provided, what was required, and then what could be removed, if any. We wanted to provide a level of scalability all over the alternative scenarios and make sure that we can implement this in a flexible manner um, that makes sense for the city. Consider business operations. We didn't want to affect, this is a, this is a thriving, there's low vacancy in this area. The commercial is operating presently, so we needed to make sure that we provide a plan that they can continue operating as such without negatively affecting them. And then we wanted to mitigate visual impact and improve the walkability connectivity of the area. One of the main, main things that we took a look at also was the cost of implementation and construction. So this was a kind of a full conceptual look at the, the redesign of the master parking area. And so I'm available for any comments or questions that you may have. Nice. I'm curious about the cost. I mean, that's the yeah, that's the big <laughs> thing. I mean, Love the plan. But they're they're absolutely beautiful Dollars. and forward thinking, and and you know, Sampa Road has looked tired and worn out for a long time. Um, so 
but we're just not coming up with a plan to finance. Right. So do we want to um, make a motion to move forward with the plan <coughs> pending funding? Right now it's just under uh, discussion. Discussion. Let's, you can talk about that, but I don't think you're looking for that, Mr. Goodwin. No, we're, we just want to make sure we're on the right track here. We'll obviously look for funding. This would be prioritized with all of our other capital projects, but make sure that we're on the right track with the commission on moving forward with updating the look along sample of the property we own. I'll just say, I mean, I think it is like uh, Commissioner Vinola said, it's very forward thinking. Uh, obviously, it was uh, nice to dream a little bit while looking at all of that, right? And imagining, you know, driving down sample and seeing people with their families sitting in the, the little patios eating and, you know, just enjoying the beautiful day in Coral Springs. Um, but definitely we need to obviously look at costs and see uh, what's feasible and how we can, you know, if any, get some of this done. So, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Uh, Commissioner Daly. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Manager, at some point, can we get an update on, um, not directly related, but I think it ties in, I think at one point we had a program, or maybe we still have that program, that provides um, partnership dollars with the business owners on that on that same strip. I mean, look, this is all great, and I don't want to rain in anybody's parade. It's wonderful, but there are buildings that have not been upgraded since before Commissioner Simmons was alive. So um, I think that's got to be part of the process, too. It's nice to have a nice walkway, but if your building hasn't had any improvement in all those years, it's not doing much. We can provide that uh, program. Yeah, I just want to get an update on it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank Jeff. you. Thank you very much. Now we need to return to item 11. Good morning again. I think we have our presentation up. Excuse me. Here we go. We got it. Okay, so basically what this is, this is a summary of where we are with the wayfinding program for downtown Coral Springs. Uh, over the last year, I worked with Danielle's team to go through the assessment, uh, design several concepts, uh, develop those into a single concept. So we've gone through and completed the design refinements. So where we are now is we've gone through documentation. So when that documentation is ratified, then that will uh, hopefully go into uh, bidding. So this is the family of sign types as, uh, as developed. Uh, and what this document is, these are excerpts from the design intent document, which is one of three that will be used for the bidding process. Uh, so in this family, we have the uh, monument gateway signs that would be located at the arrival points into the downtown. Uh, the ve vehicular directionals uh, that would consist of two types that would, uh, in, as far as sizes, addressing speed, number of lanes, visibility distances, and so forth. And these are all, um, uh, these abide by FDOT guidelines and uh, tested visibility uh, regulations as well, and setbacks and all that's required uh, uh, to be in compliance. Uh, so we've got the vehicular guide signs. We have isolated signs that direct, uh, uh, guide people to either the hospital or parking. Uh, and we also have one for the library as well, using the uh, uh, standard uh, icon. Um, there's one sign type in here, which I don't think we're gonna use. It was, it was put in here as an alternate, and you see that as a, uh, a vehicular guide sign in the um, in the median. Preferably, we like to place signs on the right-hand side of the road. This was designed in case uh, we didn't have a spot uh, that was optimal, but I think we've resolved that. And then we also have pedestrian guide signs, uh, as well as um, information kiosks. So this is a, a detailed view of the gateway monument. Uh, front and back. These will have a, a passive illumination uh, for evening viewing. Uh, they are um, developed so that they uh, abide by the required setbacks within the median. This is the larger version of the vehicular guide sign. 
uh, front and back view. Uh, there was an original request to see if we could illuminate these, but for many reasons that wouldn't be uh, very practical. They are made of reflective uh, materials, so they become very uh, uh, well seen um, at <coughs> night. These are the isolated singular messages for the library um, and the hospital. And what you don't see here is a parking uh, guide sign. This is a smaller version of the vehicular guide signs. This is just a recap of all the sign types with their messages. This is the pedestrian guide. Again, you can't really see it on the screen here, but we've laid out all of the message versions of these signs. And then the information kiosk. Originally, we were going to mount all these on a freestanding uh, base, but we found that there were some options to accommodate um, uh, uh, pedestrian access by installing these on existing light posts. So this would not only reduce costs, but it also makes better use of the environment. Close-up view of the kiosks with the area map. And that's basically a recap. Uh, you know, if we have discussions or want to talk about more on placement, I have also included uh, locator maps as well, but uh, I'm open for any comments or discussions. Any questions? Commissioner Bignola. I'm sure this is done on purpose, but um, I personally would like to see us somewhere in those signs put the city's logo. I know it's downtown and they have their own logo and design and sure. stuff, but I'd like to see us at some point. Um, okay. If I could back up, into some of the signs. I can show you what we've done just to kind of get explained. Yeah, but yeah, that was, that was definitely a discussion. Um, seemed to call this back up. Here we go. So I know that these these images are very very hard to see, but if you go if you look back at the um, the uh, vehicular guide signs on the back of the sign, we've got the logo. Uh, because you have a very limited uh, readability on these signs, you have like a few seconds. We elect not to put uh, a lot of extra stuff on these things because they're not going to be seen. Uh, so that's why we elected like at least put them on the back of the sign. So it still represents the brand. You'll, so vehicles traveling in the other direction will see this logo. And you'll also notice in the structure of the sign, it has elements of the brand. So it, it's, it, we like to recommend that the logo isn't put on everything because it starts to reduce the, um, the reverence of the, of the logo. So instead, using elements of it, so at least you replicate the brand in the environment. So it will be seen, it's just not on an every single sign. I was talking not, not the downtown logo, actually the, the city logo. Oh, uh, the city the, logo? The sun logo. And, and I, understand. I understand, you know, on the, on the big sun you're driving by or whatever, but like even in the directionals somewhere, just, I don't know. And yeah. That's kind of how I feel. I don't know if the rest of the commission feels that way. I just like to see it somewhere incorporated in there because it's, it's so different. You know, the, the downtown uh, branding is so different than what ours is. I'd like to see some uniformity right, right. across the board, even within sure. the downtown. Uh, area, but well, that, that hasn't come up. But the, the, usually, what we do is we we try to avoid having more than one brand because it starts it starts to uh, kind of compete with the message of the sign. Right. Um, what you could do is that might be uh, located on, uh, for example, the information kiosk because you'd have room, you have a captive audience, so you don't have to worry about you know the amount of time it takes to to read through a sign. Any questions. Other questions? Do we need we need a motion? Move. Second. Who's second? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. John. Okay. Moving on to Commissioner Communications. Commissioner Simmons. All right. Uh, first, I would like to take a moment and show some gratitude to our uh, Coral Springs Police Motorcycle Unit. Uh, this unit currently has six officers with 22 schools to cover. Uh, they spend weekday mornings and afternoons to make sure uh, people are obeying school zones as well as 
making sure our children uh, get to school and return home safely. Uh, as I understand, they are a bit stretched right now, uh, and hopefully in the future we can get them some more help, but I just wanted to take a moment to show them a little bit of appreciation because they do have a bit of a, a tough job during the weekday. Um, I also want to uh, show some appreciation to our Coral Springs Fire, uh, fire Department. Uh, my colleagues and I recently attended their department award ceremony, uh, and I found myself in awe at some of the stories um, of uh, you know firefighters and EMTs uh, saving lives and uh, just the general display of bravery that they show every day in our community. Um, I also want to say thank you to the staff for creating a platform, um, speakupcoralsprings.org, uh, which not only engages with residents, but also uh, seeks to educate the residents on upcoming issues. Uh, currently, the staff has asked residents uh, questions and to weigh in on the issue of allowing uh, medical marijuana treatment centers uh, here in Coral Springs. So thank you for that uh, effort to um, you know, just reach out and, and hear from the community. Uh, lastly, uh, the legislative session has started in Tallahassee uh, and will continue until May 3rd. Uh, already we have seen bills and committees aimed uh, to further erode local government authority and autonomy. Uh, and I have to ask, where does state interference end? Uh, it is my hope that during this session and every session afterward, local governments throughout the state of Florida uh, will stand together and fight for home rule. Uh, it has been more than 50 years since Floridians gave cities the right to perform municipal functions and deliver services uh, without express permission from the state. We do not wish to be opposing uh, one another, and in fact, it would be in the best interest of every Floridian uh, if the state and local governments could collaborate more instead of hardening an adversarial relationship. Uh, so let's curb state interference and let's get back to the business of taking care of our residents. And that's the end of my communications for the day. Thank you, Commissioner Simmons. Commissioner Mignola. Um, recently I had the privilege of uh, going to opening day Little League at Coral Springs, uh, American Little League, where I played as a kid and coached. Um, and got to throw out the, the opening day pitch. And it's one of the things I look forward to just because all the time I spent there as a kid and I've, this is the ninth year I think I've done it. Um, uh, and, and although I know you are gonna ask me later, I, I brushed back the batter is what I did, but I didn't <laughs> bounce it. Um, but I will tell you, and I, and I want to compliment Rick Engel and his staff for the, uh, the Hafey Field probably looked better than I remember it since I was a kid. And the amount of work that's gone into the park out over there and, and the job that your crews have done to really make improvements and strides in our parks. It, it, it is showing, and, and I had a few residents actually say, hey, you know, everything looks really nice out over here. Um, so I wanna give you credit for that, and, and please let your staff know. Um, our residents are noticing. Um, coming up on uh, Saturday, the moving to park from 7.30 to 9 p.m. at the, the Hotel Transylvania 3 uh, at Betty Stradling Park. Uh, our town's also this upcoming weekend, uh, Friday through uh, Sunday at the Sportsplex. I know Commissioner Simmons touched on the firefighter awards the other night, and, and, and you know, and, um, every year we're, we're really impressed. The one thing that, that always really sticks with me um, after uh, the awards is when you see all the families that come up and hug the firefighters that, that uh, you know, save their lives, and you see that they have that relationship, and you see some of our firefighters shedding tears back, and you see they've built that relationship, and that's something that I think is uh, pretty awesome that um, you know, really moves me. Um, we have the mayoral election coming up on Tuesday, March 12th. Um, some of the polling sites are not gonna be the same as uh, typically you would expect in the November election. Um, so if you'd like to check ahead of time and see where you're supposed to go out and vote, please check BrowardSOE.org uh, for your polling locations or you can go ahead and call them at 954-357-7050. Um, I'll be holding my office hours this month on March 19th at noon at Pasquale's on Royal Palm. Uh, if you'd like to book an appointment, please call 954-344-5911. Or if you want to speak with me directly uh, any other time, please call me on my cell phone at 954-632-7544. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bignola. Commissioner Daly. Thanks, Vice Mayor. I'll be uh, brief. As you heard Commissioner Simmons mention, the 2019 legislative session has started and I'm still <laughs> here. <laughs> um, so we are still working through that. The, um, as I mentioned a couple weeks back, the Speaker of the House um, has decided at this point that I will not be sworn in until June 18th of 2019, well after the 2019 legislative session. Um, I respectfully disagree with that decision, um, and we have a lot of folks kind of working um, behind the scenes with the Speaker and, and with our team to kind of uh, come to some sort of compromise. My hope 
is that um, upon the date of the primary election, which is set for April 9th, uh, at that point I could be sworn in and uh, would be able to go up to Tallahassee. So I remain uh, committed and ready to serve whenever that time may be. I understand that it's prerogative, it's the prerogative of the, of the Speaker and, and the House to decide when to seat their, their members, but I do look forward to it. Uh, we'll be certainly keeping an eye on, on what's going on in Tallahassee. Um, I can tell you since the last time I spoke on this item that at least one of the measures, and I'm not saying there won't be others, but at least one of the measures that uh, was kind of tone deaf, particularly given the fact that we just went through the, the one year anniversary of the shooting at Stoneman Douglas, one of the measures that had proposed to roll back some of the um, new law passed just last year has, um, has not progressed. Um, in this legislative session, and that's positive. I think that's a positive for our community. I think it's a positive for our state. Uh, but that's not to say that there won't be others, and that doesn't mean there won't be uh, attempts at, at last-minute uh, rollbacks of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Act um, throughout session. So um, that being said, in the meantime, the District 97 office is still operational. So um, if folks have uh, constituent issues related to state agencies and state entities, uh, that district phone number is 954-892-0083. Um, or, although I'm not in the office yet, I'm happy to be helpful. As always, my cell is 954-778-3304. Uh, and at least for the next couple uh, couple weeks, my email address is ddaily at coralsprings.org. Feel free to, uh, to reach out. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Daly. One more reminder, St. Patrick's Day weekend is Coral Springs Festival of the Art at the um, walk in parking lot and as Commissioner Simmons stated about the fire department recognition one of the things that impressed me as Commissioner Vignola also stated was never give up there was one patient that was defibbed eight times and he's with us here today so very very impressive I was very proud of the men and women there um, also very proud of staff for putting on innovation uh, you have to come. We do this every year. It is amazing some of the products that are presented and great ideas for cost saving and saving money. And the winner is a kid that's going to go up against Groupon. I was just beyond impressed. It was a great event. And lastly, um, we will have a new mayor at the next meeting. Thank you so much for the opportunity to serve as your mayor pro tem. I have enjoyed it. And looking forward to serving, serving with whoever wins in the upcoming election on March 12th. My hours this month will be on March 18th and 4 p.m. To make an appointment, 954-344-5911. Mr. City Manager. No report. Mr. City Attorney. Nothing further. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming.